I believe I will start. I spent a good deal of the, of the lecture on Tuesday uh, <coughs> taking issue with the uh, chapter on the Latin West from 1200 to 1500 in the Earth and its Peoples, and that was entirely warranted. It's a badly written and badly conceived chapter. Uh, nonetheless, um, it is apparent that something happened in Europe that is of historical moment, and that during this period between 1200 and 1500, Europe seems to have, uh, to use a sort of 20th century phrase, taken off. Some things start to happen more dynamically in certain parts of Europe than before, and it leads on to the Reformation, to the scientific revolution, to the industrial revolution, to imperial greatness, to European domination of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody really disagrees that something happens at some point that sets Europe on a track that is of great historical importance. There is profound disagreement on the question of what it was that happened in Europe and when it happened. Uh, there are a number of theories that have been uh, put forward and debated, and some of those theories are um, uh, somewhat more plausible than others. But it's also clear that there are many other theories that are possible that have not been um, uh, explored as much. One of the most obvious theories uh, is the notion of uh, the relationship between capitalism and the Protestant Reformation. Now, to be sure, that takes place in the 1500s, uh, not in the period covered by this chapter. But if you're going to look at the question of when did Europe undergo a uh, significant uh, change of direction or acceleration in a particular direction, uh, you, you have to look at a continuum. You can't simply pick a date and say, well, it's uh, this or that. The debate over Protestantism and the uh, spirit of capitalism uh, focuses on the work of the sociologist and sociological historian Max Weber, and it presumes that the religious uh, views of Protestants <coughs> as determined by the uh, theological views of their ecclesiastical leaders um, had an impact upon their performance, upon the way they led their life in the real world. And the view that Weber singles out is the notion of predestination and the idea that some people from the moment of birth or the moment of conception were destined for paradise, that you could not alter God's will, <clears throat> uh, and that it was implausible that God would inflict upon people who were destined for paradise uh, material impoverishment uh, in this world. Uh, and that therefore, if you you may not know whether you're destined for paradise, but if you did well in this world, it would appear to improve the chances of your doing well in the next world. And therefore, uh, Protestants were uh, inclined to, uh, to become uh, successful businessmen, investors, entrepreneurs, and so forth. Many, many different objections can be made to this. And the reason it became so important as a view uh, in the 1950s in particular was that it appealed to Western and particularly to American uh, sociologists and historians because it suggested that the behavior of people in the, uh, in the economic uh, life was a function of their religious beliefs. What made that important was because it was the reverse of what 
Karl Marx had advocated, that is to say that the, uh, the infrastructure, the mode of production, and the position of any individual within a class struggle um, is basically the determinant of how they behave in this world. And the theology or religious rituals that they engage in are a kind of uh, superstructural epiphenomenon of no intrinsic importance. They can be an opiate for the masses, perhaps, or they can be simply a um, display of uh, class privilege for the uh, feudal elite. But, uh, but belief does not determine uh, economic behavior. And Weber was saying that belief does determine uh, economic behavior. So in the context of the Cold War, particularly in the United States, which was far less influenced at the level of intellectual uh, endeavor uh, than Europe by Marxism. And to say most intellectuals in Europe were to some degree uh, oriented toward Marxism or specifically away from Marxism, whereas the Marxist tendency in the United States remained very limited. And here was Weber, a bona fide um, German scholar of highest rank and accomplishment who was saying that Marx had it backwards. This doesn't mean that Weber was right. And, uh, and so you had other people who, uh, who took other views as to what happened to change Europe. And uh, they were less perhaps influential at a broad intellectual point of view because their views did not in particular uh, you know, coincide with the grand ideological struggles of the 20th century. Uh, but from a, from a historical point of view, uh, you have to look at what some of the other possibilities were. The one that has gotten so much uh, play in the last few years, particularly since 9-11, is the idea that borrowings from the Muslim world were the trigger that, uh, that set Europea, Europe on a different track. Those borrowings have been <clears throat> focused on uh, science and philosophy and medicine. And we have ample uh, documentation of the translation into Latin of works on medicine, philosophy, and science. Uh, and of the uh, movement of these works into the curricula of the universities that were coming to be founded in Europe. <clears throat> and indeed, it's been argued, particularly by the late George Mack, to say that the universities of Europe were actually patterned on the medrases or the colleges um, of the Muslim world, and that the whole notion of higher education <clears throat> moving out of the monastery and into the university was a borrowing from Islam. Uh, nowadays, uh, the notion of borrowing from the Muslim world has expanded a good deal. Uh, for, oh, you know, it, it is not opposed to anything that has been said previously with regard to science or theology or philosophy or uh, medicine, but rather it now takes in a great deal more in the area of everyday culture and uh, technology and manufacturing. So that um, the introduction of new industries into Europe, uh, the paper industry, uh, and these are things that happened in the time period covered by this chapter, 2000 to 15, uh, 1200 to 1500, that is to say before the Protestant Reformation, before the period that Weber picked out as the crucial period. Uh, you have the introduction of a papermaking industry, uh, which is uh, accompanied by the introduction of printing, uh, the first uh, unquestionably a borrowing from the Muslim world, and the second, uh, in all likelihood, at least a partial borrowing from the Muslim world, so that you had a, um, uh, a new medium for the dissemination of ideas and opinions through printed texts 
and even when they were not printed through the uh, abundant availability of paper, which uh, was far more, um, far cheaper and more easy to, accept, to access than, uh, than parchment. Uh, you had a cotton industry that starts in northern Italy in the, uh, in the 14th century. Uh, the cotton industry is borrowed uh, from the Muslim world. You will find a great deal written in standard history books of Europe about the wool industry, uh, particularly between Britain and Flanders, uh, and the, uh, the sale of woolens. You find very little written about the sale of cottons. Uh, the, uh, even though for southern Europe, cottons obviously were a, uh, were a major um, uh, improvement in the types of fabrics available. You have a silk industry that gets introduced uh, from the Middle East, from the Islamic world. You have a, um, uh, a sugar industry that is introduced. Uh, sugar is introduced primarily from Egypt. Uh, it gets uh, transferred onto islands in the Mediterranean, particularly uh, Cyprus, um, under Italian uh, control. Uh, slaves are used to produce sugar, and this becomes the model that is then shifted to the islands of the Atlantic, uh, like uh, the Canary Islands and uh, Cape Verde and so forth, and then from there, to the islands of the Caribbean. So the, uh, the Caribbean uh, sugar industry, which becomes the economic mainstay of uh, Western European imperial domains, uh, is a borrowing from the Muslim, uh, Muslim world. Uh, soap making comes in from the Muslim world. Uh, a huge change in the ceramics uh, industry with a far more complex and uh, versatile glazing techniques borrowed from, uh, from Muslim uh, sources. Um, glass, uh, particularly in Venice, uh, a new wave of glass making, uh, uh, an expansion of, uh, of glass making and, uh, and glass making techniques. Uh, you have it in, in, in culture. The, um, in the Renaissance, the, the lute becomes the standard instrument for you know, the, uh, uh, the casual uh, romantic who wants to entertain his lady love. Uh, and the lute is simply a, uh, a version of uh, the Arabic stringed instrument, the, the oud. El oud becomes, um, becomes loot. There are verse forms that get transferred from Arabic uh, in Spain or a mixture of Arabic and uh, Romance uh, language in Spain into French and Italian. Um, there are food uh, imports that become important. Uh, it's, this is the period when pasta enters into, uh, into Italy. Uh, it is not wonton imported from China. It is uh, uh, brie imported from North Africa. And uh, it's fairly clear when you read you know, recent books on the history of pasta that this is a borrowing across the Mediterranean from North Africa into Southern Europe. So what you have now with a lot of Muslim intellectuals, and with some justification, is the thought that the, uh, the takeoff of Europe into what becomes uh, a role as the, uh, the uh, vanguard of modernity uh, was provided by the Muslims and that they provided the springboard that allowed Europe to take off. Uh, the number of works have been written recently uh, touching upon this, and there's a, with a good deal of, um, of historical justification. Uh, the response 
uh, from Islamophobes is that, yeah, so you were creative a thousand years ago. Like, we care. Um, you know, if, if all these things were a springboard to modernity, why didn't you do it yourself? No, you lazy Arabs, you. Uh, it's, um, it's become highly politicized. And this politicization is kind of a mirror of the politicization you had between Marx and Weber. Marx and Weber, you had the idea that you had the Eastern communists that had a, a clearly inferior philosophy of Marxism that stressed the infrastructural role, whereas in the West we had Weber who taught us to value our religious beliefs, our spiritual superstructure, and this was in the Cold War. Now we have the idea of um, people in the East, but then now the Muslim East rather than the Communist East, saying, we're the ones who gave you modernity. And the people in the West saying, you may have had something to do with the roots of modernity, but you couldn't do anything with it because you are uh, not up to the task. So histori historiography gets um, uh, involved in the current political uh, disputes. Um, then there are, there are other approaches to it. Uh, one of the best uh, known <coughs> has to do with the birth of the, uh, the subfield of history, which is history of science. History of science stresses that it is during this period, during the 15th century and then the 16th century, that you have the challenge to the Ptolemaic view of the world or the universe, which saw the, um, uh, which visualized uh, all of the, the planets, the moon and all the planets and the sun revolving around the earth uh, and replacing it with the Copernican system of the earth and the other heavenly orbs uh, with the exception of the moon, which does revolve around the earth, uh, all revolving around the sun, the heliocentric system. They say that this is the, uh, this is the intellectual trigger that sets people moving. From time to time, I have proposed to scholarly colleagues, European historians, that they, that they can consider a thought experiment in which uh, it is cloudy every night in Europe from 14, well, say from 1350 to 1550. Uh, sunshine during the day, no problem with that, but it just clouds up every night, kind of like San Francisco with the, the fog coming in every, every evening over the Golden Gate. And um, it just was cloudy every night, so nobody could observe the movements of the heavenly bodies. So there couldn't have been a Tycho Brahe or a Copernicus, uh, and ultimately the observations that Newton used to, uh, to confirm his ideas about uh, the law of gravity would not have been available. Supposing you simply could not have had observational astronomy over this crucial period, would the history of Europe have been different? And when I raise this question, <coughs> the people who, who are willing to take such silliness seriously uh, divide into two camps. You have one camp that says, um, yes, this would have changed everything. Because if the Copernican system had not come to be postulated and accepted, the church would have remained dominant. And it was only by dethroning the church that, uh, that the modern world could come into being. Um, and they don't see any other, uh, any other example of how the church could have been dethroned. You know, what other doctrine of the church could have been so, uh, so indisputably uh, challenged and refuted as the Ptolemaic notion of an Earth-centered universe. The other response I get is, well, now that you ask me to consider it, there really are almost no spin-off technologies or spin-off effects from observational astronomy, as there are today. I mean, 
no, unless we happen to spot an asteroid heading toward the Earth and we have to send Bruce Willis up to get rid of it. But, um, but by and large, observational astronomy is kind of a charming pastime that produces profound but ultimately not very important ideas. Um, it doesn't create uh, new industries. It doesn't employ tons of people. Uh, and so this camp would say, even if there had been no Copernican system, Europe would have gone on its, on its way. It was, it was uh, on a path, and it didn't depend upon that. And they, if they want to engage the issue of the church, they would argue, no, regardless of the Copernican system, the challenge to the church uh, was going to take place because uh, the, the debate that was stimulated more than anything or as much as anything by the translations from Arabic, the debate over nominalism and realism was a crucial philosophical debate that ultimately the nominalists won. So that a, a nomen in Latin is a name. It's also the word for a noun. And so uh, uh, a, a nominal uh, position uh, said that the absolute um, entities that platonic thinking encourages or indeed requires that you believe, happiness, goodness, um, uh, numbers, uh, sh forms of everything, all of these abstract invisible forms that Plato requires to exist in order for you to understand uh, the material world about you. So you, you only know that this is a table because it shares certain attributes with all other things that you call table. Uh, and those attributes all relate to an unseen absolute of tableness that is existent someplace. Okay, the nominalists said that table is simply a noun. It isn't a thing. You know, that is a tableness is not a thing. Um, it is simply a name, simply a noun. There is no abstract, invisible, you know, supernal, eternal table that is out there as Plato argues. So a realist, and here this is one of the many meanings of the word realist that have evolved over, over time. Nowadays say it's a big term in international relations theory, but uh, for the 14th, 15th century, a realist was someone who said the, the, the platonic forms are real. They actually exist. They are simply invisible. But the absolutes exist. So um, th it's out of this kind of debate that you got the issue of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Are angels real? Uh, or is angel just a word? Um, the, uh, the radical nominalists, uh, of whom William of Ockham uh, becomes the, the best known, uh, the radical nominalists said, let's look at everything in the simplest possible way and simply not uh, presume that there are platonic absolutes. Let's just take, treat things as nouns. And out of this arose, to a large degree, experimental science, which said, well, let's just see what there really is that is real in the material sense, not real in the absolute platonic sense, and deduce things from that. So somebody who wanted to challenge the role of the Copernican uh, universe at the central, uh, center of, uh, of intellectual change 
could be challenged from the point of view of the nominalist saying that regardless of the, of the movement of the heavenly spheres, um, we are going to, to change our way of thinking and give much more importance to the material, uh, you know, the, the demonstrable material uh, surroundings that we live in uh, on, on this planet. And uh, we're not going to, uh, to pay that much attention to the notion of abstract uh, things. And of course, one of the things about the heavenly spheres was what are they? Are they you know, fiery balls? Are they crystal balls? Are they simply bright spots that are, being, that are moving as part of a huge crystalline sphere? Um, the Copernican system didn't really clarify all of that, although Galileo, by observing the moons of Jupiter and uh, the irregularities of the, of the surface and so forth, um, pretty well established that they were, the planets at least, were terrestrial, but the, the stars remained enigmatic. But the, the nominalists said, let's deal with this world. And um, they would have said that regardless of what was happening at the level of science. So you have um, a history of science theory that says that astronomy is everything, uh, and uh, arguments made against that. You have a uh, political economy theory saying that it is Protestant thought that is dominant, uh, and um, that doesn't fit very well chronologically with what, what is happening. You have a Muslim borrowing theory that works pretty well for the Renaissance, but doesn't explain things very well after the Renaissance kind of peters out, uh, which it, it does by the, uh, you know, by the late 16th century. So we, we don't have a very clear notion of what it was that happened uh, in Europe. And there are probably a half dozen other theories that might be, um, that might be talked about. Uh, that would su suggest something that happened that moved things uh, that moved things along in a way not previously uh, anticipatable. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of them um, because I like to, uh, not because it is necessarily the most um, provable of of the lot. But what I'm going to talk about is uh, wheel transportation. Uh, the first carriage, the first passenger carriage uh, in England uh, was apparently um, imported from Holland in, uh, in the 1550s. Uh, the Queen Elizabeth, observing it, decided that she would order a, a carriage for herself. But uh, before that time, carriages were, uh, were rare, were unknown in England, and were fairly rare elsewhere in Western Europe. If you go back to uh, the beginning of, of the time period of this chapter, back to 1200, uh, you see one of the reasons for the rarity of the carriage, and that is that it was considered to be shameful for a man to ride in a wheeled vehicle. In the 1170s, uh, Chrétien de, uh, de Troyes uh, wrote a long poem in Old French called The Knight of the Cart. And the knight of the cart is uh, Sir Lancelot. And Guinevere has been kidnapped by an evil person and somebody has to go and rescue uh, Guinevere. So various knights rush off, including Lancelot, and who is crazy mad in love with Guinevere. And um, on his quest, uh, he loses his horse. Having lost his horse, he still has to go and rescue Guinevere. So he comes upon a farmer who is making his way along a forest path uh, in a cart 
and he, he hitches a ride. By doing this, he has uh, committed a shameful act that cannot be undone. He will now be known as the knight of the cart, the knight who did something so shameful as to get in a wheeled vehicle. Uh, this had been, for hundreds of years, um, uh, in the post-Roman period, um, a standard of European society, it appears. Uh, men could not uh, ride in carts or wagons uh, and retain uh, their dignity as men. Uh, there are instances on record where you have uh, rulers or uh, high nobles who are supposed to attend some uh, important event who will send a messenger to say that the individual is not in sufficient health to ride a horse. Uh, because if he didn't come on horseback, then he might as well not come at all, because riding on a horse was simply wrong, or riding on a vehicle was simply wrong. You had to ride on a horse. Everybody rode on a horse, uh, or on a mule, uh, or on a, uh, on a donkey, or on a hinny, whatever they had, but riding was the way you, uh, the way you went. Um, the only exceptions were for women uh, of the highest rank, of course, there were exceptions for, for serfs. You know, peasants could take a ride because they had no, no dignity to lose. Besides, if you're on a farm, you might actually need a cart for bringing in the harvest or something of that sort. But for anyone of any rank, they couldn't do it. And um, uh, there were, you know, women who became notable uh, let's say Richard II of England's wife, Anne of Bohemia, was uh, an expert at riding side saddle. And she kind of set the example for, a, for the English noble women that they really had to get out there and get on a horse and not travel around in a wheeled vehicle. So this comes to an end in the 1500s. By uh, the early, the very, say, the first decade of the 1600s, there is a bill being considered in Parliament in England to restrict the use of carriages. Uh, why? Because they are driving the, uh, the water taxi people on the Thames River out of business. Because everyone now has a carriage. So, you know, between zero carriages in 1500, and carriages becoming the, the standard <coughs> for the nobility by 1600, you have a revolution in transportation. Um, well, you might say, well, why single out the transportation system? I'd simply point out that when we deal with modern uh, history, that's say the 19th and 20th century, uh, transportation is one of our chief uh, areas of, of study. Uh, railroads, uh, and then bicycles, then automobiles, um, down to the present day. Uh, we have considered transportation, both the ways of moving and the surfaces upon which uh, wheeled vehicles move, we have considered this to be a cutting edge of and an index of the change in a society. You know, uh, who builds cars? How many do they build? You know, will the electric car become uh, the signature vehicle of the Obama administration? Who knows? But we have considered transportation to be of enormous importance, wheel transport, for 19th to 20th century history. And yet, we have paid almost no attention to the startup of this, which goes back to the 16th century. But in Western Europe, not in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Europe, it goes back not just to the, uh, to the 15th century, but indeed to the 14th century. 
this is one of the reasons why in talking about uh, Latin Europe, but not including Eastern Europe or the Ottoman areas in Southeastern Europe, we miss one of the great uh, uh, developments of the time because the, the, the carriage uh, or the coach uh, seems to have become popular first in Hungary. Uh, there is no real disagreement on this, not necessarily because the only historian who's written about it is Hungarian, but everyone seems to agree with his, what he says. Coach is a Hungarian word, uh, and the practice spreads from east to west so that you find German princes uh, will adopt a carriage uh, oh, uh, a generation or two or more before you will find the carriage being adopted in uh, France or England. So here is a, um, uh, a change that is, uh, that is coming from the East. What is it that has changed? What is a coach? What is a carriage? The Romans had had four-wheeled vehicles. And indeed, we can trace four-wheeled vehicles back into uh, prehistory in Europe, back to oh, somewhere around 3,500 BC. Um, so it's, it's not a completely new idea, but the coach had, uh, had certain improvements that have been much debated in the sort of arcane uh, scholarly literature on the subject. Uh, there are five essential um, elements that are part of the debate. One of them is changes in the harnessing of animals. And there is agreement that from around 1000 onward, perhaps a little bit earlier, there are new ways of harnessing um, horses that come to be known in Europe. There is disagreement, there are two new types, um, uh, but both of them amount to the same thing. That is to say, uh, ways of harnessing uh, horses that uh, increase the pulling efficiency of the horses. So that's one thing that, that happens, you have new harnessing. But that is several hundred years before uh, the coach develops. Secondly, you have the question of, of steering. With a two-wheeled vehicle, which is the vehicle of choice for every rational wheel user in the world prior to motor transport, um, steering is not a big problem. Uh, when the animal moves, or the pair of animals moves in a different direction, the cart follows them. With a four-wheeled vehicle, it is very different. Um, if you've ever tried to, you've gotten one of those shopping carts with the wheels that aren't turning right, and you've tried to maneuver around an aisle, and it's, it annoys you so much, you have to pick the damn thing up and, and uh, you know, sort of muscle it around. Uh, if the wheels don't pivot, uh, you have a very hard time uh, making any sort of a, a turn, except over a very, very um, wide radius. The heavier the weight in the cart, the harder it is to turn it. So without steering, uh, without a pivoting, uh, pivoting the wheels in some way, you can't readily um, uh, turn uh, a four-wheeled vehicle. Now, if you if you have a four-wheeled vehicle. Um, and you have you know, a wheel coming out here, another one back here. The problem is that if you are going to pivot the front axle, as soon as you start to turn, the wheel is going to hit the body of the wagon. Uh, now, if you make this axle long enough, you can provide for a substantial angle of turn. But then you have a very wide axle and a rather narrow 
body and um, kind of a waste of, of your space. But you can do it. The, the angle that you can turn at before it hits the body is called the lock. In other words, full lock position means that you have turned the front axle uh, as far as you can uh, without you know, hitting and uh, uh, blocking up against the, uh, the body of the wagon. Uh, it is generally thought that in Roman times uh, they had pivoting front axles that at full lock uh, might be able to pivot to turn in a maybe a three to five degree um, turning radius. Uh, this would not permit them to be used in a city. Uh, it, the, the curve they would follow at that small uh, a turning radius um, or that broad a turning radius would not give them room to maneuver. So um, without a, a solution to this, there, it was very difficult to turn a four-wheeled uh, vehicle. If you were pulling a four-wheeled vehicle across <coughs> Central Asia through endless seas of grass, you don't really care very much about you know, how long it takes to turn because you have you know, unlimited space. But if you're talking about using a vehicle in town, and one of the things I should point out is that this rush to have carriages in Britain was to have carriages in town because the roads in the country were too rough uh, still for, uh, uh, for very good interurban traffic. Um, so you had, what, what could you do? Um, one thing you could do was to have a big wheel here and a small wheel here so that you could turn it and it would turn underneath the body of the wagon. And of course, if you do it just far enough, you tip over. But you know, you could find ways to, to solve that. So whenever you see pictures of um, medieval or uh, early modern vehicles, you'll notice that in most cases, the front wheels are of a smaller diameter than the rear wheels in order to allow for this front axle to, uh, to pivot. But of course, the smaller the diameter of the wheel, uh, the, the more difficulty it has on a rough surface because um, you know, the, the size of bump it can go over is going to be uh, much smaller. Uh, another possibility would be to have a vehicle with a back wheel here, a driver's seat up here, and a front wheel that is, that is not under the body of the wagon at all, but rather it is under the driver's seat. And this becomes characteristic of, uh, of most carriage designs, that you have the pivoting front axle goes under the driver's seat rather than under the body of the vehicle. Uh, I can go into tedious detail on this, and perhaps I already have, I can see. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but the point is that uh, this, the, the new experiments in pivoting uh, the front axle in order to allow the vehicle to turn at a fairly sharp angle uh, are really right around 1400. And they seem to start, as I say, in, in Hungary. Uh, now, the next thing you have is, uh, is brakes. If you have a two-wheeled cart, your, the pair of oxen or horses you have, they can pull so much. And if you're going downhill, they can hold back that same amount of weight. If you have a larger number of animals, the animals that are closest to the vehicle can hold back more weight than the ones that are farther away. You don't have a very efficient braking mechanism, but you can carry more and more weight in the vehicle because you have more, more and more animals pulling it because of the new harnessing. So you had to devise ways to, to brake uh, the vehicle as it was going downhill. And so we have various uh, new theories of braking, uh, such as to, uh, to lock 
the wheel so it won't turn. That would be one way of braking. Uh, another way would be to uh, basically throw out an anchor so you're dragging something behind you that will slow you down. Um, there is the fear, of course, that when you're going uphill and you stop, you'll slide backwards again. Uh, this is for carriages in San Francisco. And so they had the idea that if you put out a pointed stick that, at the right angle, you won't go backwards because it will dig into the pavement, which is, there's no pavement, it'll dig into the dirt. So you have a whole bunch of theories on braking. And then, of course, the one where you have a huge lever, and you pull on the lever and it rubs against the wheel and slows down the rotation of the wheel. So braking is another thing that you have with four-wheel vehicles and you don't have with two-wheel vehicles. But you don't have it before this time because before this time the harnessing really is almost used exclusively with a pair of animals that can brake themselves uh, sufficiently. So now you have braking. Then you have the question of suspension. Uh, the surfaces that uh, wheeled vehicles were pulled over were generally extremely rough. Uh, even when they were paved, they were often paved with cobblestones uh, or uh, logs or things that were basically very, very rough. And if you were in the country, uh, you were you know, going through ruts in a, on a dirt road. Uh, this made it extremely uncomfortable for the people inside. And if the people inside were princesses who were capable of feeling, you know, the discomfort of a pea through a whole stack of mattresses, <laughs> as we all know from our fairy tale background, um, if you had princesses of such sensibility, they needed to have some kind of suspension. So we have evidence of suspension that go back to the Roman period. Indeed, the Celts, who were sort of the first uh, cart drivers in northern Europe, had a, a, a type of suspension system for their two-wheeled vehicles. The Romans had something of a suspension system. Um, but then that disappears in the medieval period and reappears, just as the, the pivoting front axle disappears and then reappears uh, you have suspension disappearing and then it, it reappears. It reappears uh, basically as uh, you know, as a hammock uh, slung between uh, two uprights. And then of course you can put a you know, a top over it so nobody sees you riding in the hammock. We actually have in medieval manuscripts uh, images uh, of hammocks that are suspended in this way and we have one text that describes one in some detail. Um, once you have thought of the idea of suspending a hammock then it is a, it's a fairly narrow step, the wheels are obviously down here, uh, to, have, to saying, well, instead of a hammock, let's just put some chains or straps and then put a passenger compartment uh, you know, and drop it down on top of the chains or straps and let it sway and bounce um, along. So this, the first suspension were literally uh, suspensions. Then you had the idea that instead of having straps, why don't you have a spring? So you would have a metal spring in the place of the straps. And eventually you get other types of springs and you get modern suspension. And all of these were devices to, uh, to make it more comfortable to ride in. So you have uh, more efficient harnessing, you have steering, you have brakes, you have suspension. Uh, that's four. And then the fifth one is the, is the road surface. Uh, as the wheels, particularly those front wheels, get smaller, you have to pay more attention to the, uh, to, to the road surface. So highways are more often um, uh, streets within cities uh, gradually come to be paved. Um, very gradually. It's very expensive to pave 
uh, to pave something because you have to maintain it. And, uh, and the investment in, in uh, paving and maintaining highways uh, explains most of federal government and the Eisenhower administration. Um, it's, a, it's a huge commitment, uh, but, and it's a commitment that is, um, was related in the medieval period to the building of canals because you had canals that were built in order to go from city to city uh, or, uh, by water uh, and a canal was basically cheaper than a road because after all canal doesn't need to be kept up the water is sort of self-replenishing but the canal is slow so as would later happen between canals and railroads in the United States you have a you know issue of trade-offs between uh, one mode of transportation, another mode of transportation. So early on, when you had carriages, they, um, they were mostly in town. Between town, you had stagecoaches uh, that were, there were various names for them, uh, that were very rough to travel, to travel in, but you could go from one, uh, one town to another in a, in a stagecoach, and these develop uh, in the in the 1600s. Okay, so if you were going to do a history of transportation, you would say what is really striking about Europe taking off is that it it becomes um, mobile. But then you would raise the question of what about all these men that can't ride in vehicles? You know, wh you know, which came first, the you know, the man who was such a wuss that he would ride in a vehicle, uh, or the vehicle for him to ride in. And so one of the one of the things that is hidden in in the history of wheel transport is the history of the change in the ideology of European men. Why did European men, after hundreds of years, of feeling that riding a horse was the only dignified way to travel, why did they shift not only to riding in carriages, but to competing for the grandiosity of their carriages? Because from 1600 onward, uh, having a grand carriage, and then later having uh, any number of um, vehicles that would be specialized for display or for speed or for some other um, uh, visibly um, uh, desirable uh, purpose uh, becomes more and more important uh, down to the era of planned obsolescence of U.S. motor cars uh, in the post-World War II period. You know, wheeled vehicles become an obsession among a prosperous class of people who several centuries before had regarded it as shameful to ride in a wheeled vehicle. Now, isn't that interesting? This is something that has absolutely nothing to do with the Muslim world because you had no wheeled vehicles in the Muslim world. Uh, everybody who, trans, who went from place to place in the Muslim world uh, went there by, um, by foot or uh, riding on an animal. Uh, or by being carried in a sedan chair by human porters. But in Europe, you went from having men who rode on horses uh, to men who, uh, who rode in carriages. So something's happening to, to the male mentality that only shows up uh, in, their, uh, in their willingness to change their mode of transport. Now, most men of rank continued to ride horses. This is not, a, this is not something that sweeps, uh, that sweeps the continent. You can go down to the 19th century and find times when monarchs who are going to be um, crowned will ride to their coronation on a horse because it's the old noble way to do it. I think that uh, Tsar Nicholas the, I don't know if Nicholas II rode on a horse to be crowned, but I think his uh, predecessor 
did. <clears throat> so it isn't a complete change. But to the degree that this change occurs, it's related to uh, the disappearance of, of, the, of the night. The reason men did not uh, ride on vehicles was because knighthood required that they be equestrians. So that uh, if Lancelot, a knight, rides in a cart, he is forever shamed. If Bodo, the peasant, rides on a cart, hey, that's his way of getting from here to there. So that uh, beneath this whole business of the change in wheeled vehicles, you have changes in the military. And the changes in the military uh, have to do with um, the new vulnerability of the knight. This doesn't mean that knights were not uh, eminent warriors in the 1500s uh, or before that in the 1400s. It's just that they were eminent obsolete warriors. Uh, they had um, become uh, more and more display soldiers whose armor was incredibly elegant, but it was display armor. It was to be used in tourneys or jousts, but it wasn't really battlefield armor. If you ever go through the armor section in the Metropolitan, uh, you'll find beautiful suits of armor, and, the, and it'll be explained in the, um, in the commentary that this is display armor, uh, meant not to be actually worn in a battlefield, because most of the suits of armor are late. The late suits of armor are the most elegant, uh, because they're for display. Uh, and the early suits of armor are beat up and have holes in them because, you know, that's what happens with armor. You get hit by something and you have a dent. You know, ah, I got a ding in my chest where my heart was. Um, uh, so, so the decline of the night is, is part of this. Uh, the decline of the night is related to the rise of gunpowder. Now, our restricted chapter that deals with the Latin West says that by the time of the Battle of Crecy, French artillery had become effective and so forth and so on. Um, but gunpowder weapons are used in the 1300s and are used most effectively uh, in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, not in Western Europe. It's well known that in the siege of Constantinople in 1453, when the Ottomans bring the Byzantine Empire to an end, that large cannon were used to, uh, to blow holes in the walls. But those cannon were forged on the spot. For a big siege weapon, it would be too heavy for you to actually move it across country. So instead, you bring wagons or baskets of scrap bronze or scrap iron, and you build a forge uh, there, you know, outside the walls. And a piece of people looking at the walls are saying, what are they doing with that? <laughs> and, um, and then you forge a cannon, and then you load the cannon with, you know, cannonballs this big around, and you lob them at the walls, and the walls are, are destroyed, and you're able to take the city. Uh, but that isn't the only way to use gunpowder weapons. I mentioned last time that the Janissary Corps of the Ottoman Empire carried handheld weapons and that they were in infantry. Um, but uh, they were uh, not as advanced in their use of, of small gunpowder weapons as the Bohemians, who were the followers of Jan Hus. See, there's another thing, by, we, we, we don't cover the, 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 the Reformation in this chapter because we say the Reformation is Martin Luther. But Jan Hus, who's a generation before Martin Luther, uh, a generation or more, um, uh, and is not in Western Europe, but rather in Bohemia, which is now the Czech Republic, uh, Jan Hus was a significant reformer. He was inspired by uh, the movement of John Wycliffe. Um, 
John Wycliffe was an English uh, uh, radical who believed that common people should be able to read the Bible in their own language, who had a large following, uh, and um, his message was uh, combated by the Catholic Church. He was in too firm a position in England to be personally killed, but the movement was stamped out by the, by the church. However, I mentioned before that Anne of Bohemia, the wife of Richard II, um, uh, was an expert uh, side saddle rider. She also was someone who, after the death of her husband, returned to Bohemia. And with her came a number of aides and followers who had been influenced by John Wycliffe. So when Jan Hus is becoming a, uh, a radical from a Catholic point of view in Bohemia, he has access to the teachings of John Wycliffe, and you get this, uh, this influence in religious reform moving from a populist uh, version of, uh, of Christianity in England to, uh, to uh, the, Czech, uh, the Czech area, uh, which is Bohemia, which is the area uh, north of Vienna. Uh, Jan Hus uh, was a professor, and he was uh, at the University of Prague, and there were all sorts of uh, complications there, because the University of Prague had, um, as a number of universities had, they had four, uh, several different nations. So if you were a student, you would belong to one nation uh, or another. Uh, and there were four nations at the University of Prague, of which the Bohemians were one nation. And uh, then you had the Germans, you had the Poles, and so forth. Um, the king of Bohemia changed things and said that the Bohemians should have three votes instead of one vote, and so all the other students left and found it, went and founded universities elsewhere. This is how the University of Leipzig in uh, eastern Germany gets founded as refugees from the University of Prague who had belonged to the nation of the Germans. Uh, so Jan Hus becomes the head of the university and uh, maintains that, that the Bohemian form, the Bohemian people, should have their own uh, say in matters of religion. Um, this comes to a head uh, when uh, some of his followers um, receive a delegation of people who, who are trying to talk sense to them, and they throw them out the window. This is what's known as the defenestration of Prague. They're not hurt when they're thrown out the window. They land in a haystack, I think. Um, but it leads on to the uh, trial and conviction of Jan Hus, who is, uh, who is burned at the stake, uh, this being the, uh, the ingenious Roman Catholic um, response to heresy in that, in that time frame. Okay, the followers of Jan Hus uh, become uh, warlike, and they proceed to, uh, to fight a series of wars a series of wars uh, in which their antagonists are crusaders sent by the papacy. There are five crusades against the Christians of Bohemia by the Christians inspire, you know, following the Pope in order to suppress uh, the Hussites. Um, those wars are won fairly systematically by the Hussites. And the reason they win is because they have superior military techniques. What do they have? They have four-wheeled vehicles that they turn into tanks, basically. They, um, you have a series of vehicles. And so forth. You chain them together, you, turn, you make them into a circle, and then on their outer walls you have uh, windows that open and you shoot out of the windows with gunpowder weapons, with you know small, uh, small cannon, uh, and this, this circling of the wagons, um, 
becomes the, uh, you know, the signal uh, contribution to warfare, uh, to, to military tactics uh, by the Hussites. But it also demonstrates for the first time the, the use of vehicles in battle that are not chariots. Because, of course, the old chariot, going back to ancient times, carried the warrior, carried the warrior to the battle, and maybe even uh, provided a base for the warrior to fight from the chariot, although in the Iliad they get out of the chariot to do the fighting. But here you have the vehicle being used to have uh, protected warriors inside a closed uh, wooden uh, box where they cannot easily be reached, and they can shoot uh, at people who are outside. Of course, we've all seen Western movies where the cowboys or the, uh, the cavalry best the Indians by doing exactly this sort of thing. So they never get in the wagons. They always are hiding behind the wheels or something like that. I don't know why they don't get in the wagons, but uh, the Hussites knew better than that. So, um, so now you have the, uh, the idea of wheels and, uh, and gunpowder together. And I think it is out of this that you have evolved the notion of field artillery, where you actually carry a cannon on wheels, uh, usually on two wheels, and then you carry your cannonballs and other equipment on a limber, which is uh, basically a, a little wagon that goes along along with the cannon. Uh, and cannon become mobile instead of like the ones you had in 1453, where you just have them for siege purposes. Gradually you evolve mobile cannon, and the knights become uh, less and less uh, relevant. And artillery comes in the process of the 1600s to be the real queen of the, uh, of the military sciences. Uh, it's out of the artillery corps that Napoleon eventually emerges as the greatest uh, military thinker of, uh, of his era. Um, so the knights are becoming obsolete. Uh, the notion that they can't, that they have to ride on a horse because equestrian training is inherent to their class position, that seems to, uh, to erode fairly naturally. I don't know of any test case uh, having to do with it. But one of the striking things about carriages is that the carriage uh, can be bought by anyone who's rich enough. You know, it is not a, uh, something that is restricted to a particular segment of society. In other words, the Duke of X, who would be an aristocrat, could have a carriage. But so could uh, a prosperous merchant or a, um, uh, you know, a successful person of, of any sort if he could afford uh, if you could afford a carriage. So when you get into the area of, um, of a new wheeled society, you're talking about new markers of distinction, that instead of being a war horse and armor and a coat of arms, uh, you're having um, a grandiose uh, carriage, and you're beginning to reduce some of the difference between the, the aristocracy as people of wealth and uh, the, the wealthier members of the, uh, of the commonality. Um, now finally, I want to make reference to another theory that I'm not going to go into, um, and that is one that um, comes out of economics. That maintains, um, I'm blocking on the name of the author right now, uh, but it maintains that uh, the, the rise of the, um, of, the maximi of the rational maximizing homo economicus uh, explains the process of technological change. It's in a book called uh, Does um, Technology Determine History? The argument is that if you don't have a, a transparent market in which you people can buy goods uh, and the best goods that they can afford, 
um, then change will be restricted in various, in various ways and more or less haphazard. But once you have an open market, uh, then competition, the, the Adam Smithian market, will actually uh, regulate uh, the distribution of goods in the way we've seen so effective in 2008, so that, um, so that the super rich get super richer and everyone else, you know, sucks them up. I mean, that's, uh, but, um, but, but the point is that he argued that uh, technological change becomes inevitable uh, once you have uh, reached uh, the point where you have a capitalist market. This is not a Protestant mentality, but rather a capitalist marketplace. And by knocking down the economic distinctions between nobility and, common, and commoners, uh, and saying you can buy sumptuary goods like carriages uh, if you have enough money. Um, you get to profit, you know, profit maximizing individuals who will want to make more money so they can buy better things and they will devise ways and means of making more money by producing better and more interesting products and that Europe gets triggered into a, uh, into sort of a, a, a cascade of technological improvement because of the birth of the profit-maximizing um, uh, consumer. Now, the problem with this is that it assumes, well, one of the many problems of this, but the one that, that grabs me is that it assumes that you know what people want, that profit-maximizing is, um, is going to be primarily oriented to a marketplace. But if your notion of maximizing your happiness, to go back to the, the way Aristotle would look at it. You know, what is the end of, of human life? It's happiness. If maximizing your happiness is not having more money, but uh, rather having uh, a reputation for piety, or if maximizing your happiness um, has to do with changing your rank, buying your way into a nobility, for example, or if maximizing your happiness has to do with assuring your entrance to heaven, which might mean, uh, you know, eating, you know, gruel and groats for 50 years and living in the forest without any underwear on. Um, you know, there are so many different ways that, you, that societies conceive of maximizing uh, their happiness that the assumption that the, uh, that the, the market of buying better and uh, more desirable goods is going to be uh, uh, the dominant one is not necessarily a safe assumption, but it does seem to work for Europe. The Europeans do then seem to uh, want to buy more and better things and produce more and better things so they get more profit to buy more and better things. And that gets back to this issue of why does this start? I mean, we have any number of books now that We'll talk about comparisons between Europe and China, or Europe and uh, India, or something like that, uh, and show that the, on various material levels, Europe wasn't that different. But Europe does something different, and we don't really know why. Um, my bet is on transportation. But, uh, but that's just me, and uh, uh, it's the last I'll say on this, and this semester because next week I'm going to talk about uh, maritime matters and not about uh, land transport.